know. Right. All right, guys. It's about that time. The last of us is coming in. Just in time. Get uh, get some coffee cake. It's going quickly. I got some blueberry up back there. Maybe there's some left. Maybe there's not. I've had two pieces already. It's outstanding. <laughs> it's outstanding. Yeah. See what I do for you guys? I get myself some blueberry from coffee cake. Uh, all right. Well, uh, let me uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll jump into uh, the second part of creation. Uh, Father God, Lord, I thank you for uh, your creation. Lord, as I was driving in this morning and uh, being able to see the sunrise. Lord, uh, being able to enjoy uh, all that you've given us here. Lord, uh, again, like I prayed last week, I pray that uh, we would keep an open mind about this, um, yet uh, recognizing that you are the creator. Uh, none of this uh, was created without you or is sustained without you. I pray that, uh, um, Lord, that you would bless our time and bless our hearts and minds. I pray all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Good morning, guys. All right, uh, chapter 15, creation part two. Let's just jump right into our table discussion. So let's do this. Introduce yourself, as we always do. And then uh, here's, the, here's the question, here's the quote. And uh, what are your thoughts on this? So I'll go ahead and let you read I'll read it. The earth is only a few thousand years old. That's a fact, plainly revealed in God's word. So we should expect to find plenty of evidence for its youth, and that's what we find in the Earth's geology, biology, paleontology, and even astronomy. That's a quote I took from a website, and I'm going to leave it at that. So your thoughts on that, the Earth is only a few thousand years old, that's a fact, plainly revealed in God's Word. Go ahead, why don't you discuss that for a few minutes here. Josh. It's a good one to come in on. 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 It's a Right. 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 Right.
And I think all this shelter and stuff, I think it's a new tower of battle. Because I feel like that's, that's what you're going to be thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. Genuine belief. God knows everything you're yeah. expecting. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to be alive. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
with that state. And also with end times, we have our thoughts on it, our positions on it. We know that Christ will return. We know for sure that uh, he will come again as we're, it won't be like the first time because he came meek and mild as an infant. He's going to come in full power. There will be no doubt who he is. We know that. How and when and where Israel relates to all that, we can discuss and debate that we, because people have. <laughs> They're writing <laughs> chapters and hundreds of books on this topic and have for thousands of years. And so we, there is somewhat of a correlation. And so I think that's important for us to frame all of our discussion and thoughts on this under that. And uh, so let's, let's, let's continue. Here was our verse for, memory verse for this chapter was Nehemiah 9, 6. You are the Lord, you alone, you have made the heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them and the host of heaven worships you. There's our framework for understanding in the beginning, right? That's what we do know for sure. And any other, any other idea of creation that falls outside of that, we would have to be very careful of. But we're going to talk about that because anybody catch what one of those topics are that Grudem is very much against, that some churches have allowed for the belief? What is it? Anybody, I don't know if anyone had to read the whole chapter. What's the one he spends a lot of time on one issue of creation that he has he does not agree with that some Christians would hold to. Anybody know what that is? Theistic evolution, correct, right. So he spends a lot of time uh, talking about that, but we'll get into that in just a little bit. So here we are, uh, 16 weeks went by fast, didn't it? Peter, go ahead. Uh, on the verse, the very last a couple words there, the host of heaven worships you. I think uh, when we meditate and allow the Spirit to um, speak to us about who God is, that's what we do. We're, you know, God is looking for worshipers. That, that's kind of like the bottom line. And in one sense, we should not be told that, but as we see who he is, we fall down and we do worship him. So I like the fact that it doesn't say uh, everybody in the earth is going to worship. It's like when you, just, you know, when, when, when God spoke to, uh, oh, this gets off my nose. Anyway. Yeah, well said. Yes, absolutely. Because what was our goal for in, initiating or beginning this study? What was our purposes in this from, from the start? We started this 16 weeks ago. We're going to continue starting in September uh, with this. What was our goal? We wanted to understand who our God is more fully and completely, right? We wanted to learn of who this great God is. What has he revealed to us? And as we study the scriptures, as we read through this, I hope, just as Peter just said, our hearts are drawn to this, what a God we serve. Yes, amazing. Uh, we've gone through all the characteristics of God. To study each one of those is absolutely amazing. So I hope that we're going to do a little activity at the end here where we will look back and say, all right, what have we, what's something we've taken away from the last four months? And uh, we'll, we'll do that at the end. So here was the outline for this section. We really focus, we focus on A, B, C, and D last week. And really, we're going to spend our entire time today with letter E and then some conclusion slash application. So we're going to look this morning at the relationship between scriptures and science. And we're going to look at some of these theories. We're going to look at some actual thoughts on young or old earth. What about a gap theory? Where does evolution fall in this? What about theistic evolution? Is it okay for a Christian to hold to a belief in theistic evolution? There's some strong feelings uh, on that as well. So we're going to spend most of our, all of our time this morning on, on letter E of this, the relationship between scripture and modern science. So this, this is, is an important quote that Grudem put in his chapter, and it says, when all the facts are rightly understood when it comes to creation and science, there will be no final conflict between scripture and science. I think that is really, really important for us to understand. Um, thoughts on that? It's basically saying that you don't have to be afraid of what's going to be revealed or things that people are going to find because in the final analysis it's all going to line with the scripture. Right. Sometimes Sometimes they, they, absolutely. Sometimes we separate this from this, <laughs> right? Uh, they don't met, we, we keep them separate. And there was a, a question. Some teach that, that this whole discussion with scriptures and science is irrelevant because the scriptures were never meant or written to teach science. So why are we bothering with that? 
And so there's a thought too, we have to say what that kind of goes against this because it's a, truth is God's truth, then there is no separation of this, meaning that if you look back historically through archaeology, that the book is accurate. It isn't a separate. It's not, there's not two. There's the world and then there's scriptures. The two are one. That This is human history. Uh, this is the world we live in. We're not separating those two. But I think that's important so we don't have fear. Because we do, right? What's the, one of the terrible things that we're mostly afraid of? Someone's going to ask us a question and we'll appear foolish, right? I don't, I, don't, I don't know how that all works. And we so we have some fear of that. But I think that's good for us to rest in that is that... Uh, there is, no, there is no conflict between Scripture and science. Now, there's a whole lot of people that would disagree with that statement, right? <laughs> but we, as followers of Christ and holding to the inerrancy of Scripture, would find peace in that statement. I think the important thing with that statement, John, is that, is that understanding that we don't have all the facts. I, neither side, neither uh, science nor Scripture has revealed everything to us, right? Right. right. And, um, and so, I, we were talking earlier, there's too many times we as Christians and the other side as science, they, we talk as though these things are settled and, um, and we don't give any room for the other, uh, for ourselves to be wrong in that. And I think there's times when we are, right? We hold to a certain, a certain understanding of scripture and um, if that like creation is not settled um, we don't know exactly how that worked um, but both Christians and science have done their we dig, we dig our heels in and say well this is how this happened and in fact we don't have the facts yet right, right. and, and there, there are some Questions. Evolutionary theory does have some questions that are, that are challenging and that are hard to answer. And there are. We don't talk about that much, but there are, just to Josh's point, there are questions that are raised in evolutionary theory. And I, I'm not a, none of us are scientists. Well, I'm not a scientist here, uh, but there are some questions that need to be answered and that are hard to answer in that whole framework uh, for understanding how everything came into being. So thanks, Josh. Here was Francis Schaeffer's list of possibilities. We went over this before, but I think it's a good list. This is listed in the chapter as well. And that there are, this is him, he wrote this right in the 60s or 70s, uh, but there are some possibilities. And this is what he speaks of. These are some of the possibilities that could have been under the umbrella of in the beginning God created. And so we're going to go through some of these because some of these possibilities have been given names or theories like the gap theory, the day age theory, the... There was a 24-hour literal, but there was a whole lot of room in between those 24-hour periods. So there's going to be some theories that are, that, are, that, that are named in these. But I think it's good to say that there are some possibilities that we could take out of Genesis 1-1 uh, that, uh, that could give us some other ideas than there's a young earth and old earth. And even then we're going to talk about what about theistic evolution. So let's look at, uh, let's look at some of these theories. So... Here's really what it comes down to. There's secular theories and then intelligent design. We've all heard that's a, that's a common a common phrase. That they're, they're two polar opposites. Any secular theory is a theory that basically says that uh, that's a personal or an infinite God is not responsible for creating it. Intelligent design would be the opposite. Is that the view that God directly created the world and all of its life forms stands against the view that new species came about through an evolutionary process of random mutation. And so one, you have just a chance working itself out outside of anything else, just chance happening. If given enough time, this is what you'll get, right? And if millions, billions of years, who knows? doesn't matter. But given enough time, we'll go from the very simple and non-life to this. And then other side of that would be intelligent design. What we would hold to is that God created. So let's look at evolution first. We're going to look at Darwin's theory of evolution, and then we're going to take a look at uh, theistic evolution. And I'm, I don't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this just because you can do a lot of your own research. I want to make, just trying to pull out, this is a challenge with this chapter, is pulling out kind of what's important for us that, uh, for, that we can take away from this. So I've attempted to do that. And, uh, and Grudem spends a lot of time in this chapter, I'm going to say, what, 30 pages, discussing questions about evolution and including that questions 
and why he contradicts theistic evolution. So we're gonna see if I can highlight some of that. These are some of the things that I wrote down. These are just my thoughts here, and I think this is good. This helps me as I think about this debate, as I think about this topic, and I think about talking to other people that don't believe the way that I do. Because we are coming from a completely polar opposite worldview when you talk to someone who doesn't believe that there is a God, and certainly there isn't a God that created this. That's a myth and a fairy tale for weak-minded people. Uh, that's a religious thing. And so someone who thinks that, uh, I think we, ha we have to remember that I'm not going to be able to argue them into the truth. I think that's a really good point for us to remember because I think uh, if you're not going to believe, you're not, see, it's not a matter of believing there's a God. It's a question. If you're going to hold to that there is no God, then really this whole discussion makes zero sense to someone who doesn't believe the way that we do. Because zero. They're going to look at me and say, serious? In 2021, you actually believe this? That there, that there was a man named Noah who really built a boat and there was a flood and geology chain. You're going to believe that God created this? Hey, really? And can, Okay, and it's, we're going to be written off. And I think it's important. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't have an answer and we don't, that we run away from those conversations, but I think it's important to remember that that's not going to be solved in a debate on Facebook. It just isn't. And so I think we have to remember that is that God is the one that opens our hearts and minds to the truth. We need to be prepared to always give an answer, Paul says, but I think it's good to remember that. Uh, we should also not be surprised if we do appear foolish uh, to others. 1 Corinthians 1, Paul writes, For the word of the cross is folly or foolishness uh, to those who are perishing. So what we hold to is foolishness to the rest of the world that's watching us. It is. They don't understand it now. If it wasn't for Almighty God opening our eyes to the truth, it would be foolishness to us as well. And so I think it's just good men to remember that and keep that framework. And then last, we don't have to know every scientific fact and counter-argument. Uh, we're not scientists. We're not. And we don't have to have all of the answers. And uh, I believe that uh, when Isaiah wrote that uh, when God's word never comes back void, it accomplishes every word that it was sent out for, that when we speak and open our mouths, we might walk away thinking, I kind of sounded bumbling, right? I didn't really, I wasn't very articulate. And boy, I really messed that up. Yet I believe that God and his sovereignty uses that whenever we open our mouth, whenever we speak, every conversation, so we can rest in these things. I, I try to think these things anytime you do have a conversation, and I like what, it, it's, we shouldn't be afraid. We don't have to fear this, is that we do have the truth. And we don't have to know all the answers because we serve the one who does. And so I think this helps us to put this whole context in a framework that gives us peace. So let's look at some uh, topics or other definitions. This is just under natural selection and evolution. So we've got macroevolution. This is the general theory of evolution or the view that all organisms emerged from non-living substance. And that just happened over time and happened over chance. And so we've, we've talked about this before. I've, I keep coming back to that example of going to the museum of, uh, of, uh, in Chicago, the uh, not Field Museum, yes, Field Museum. You go to the exhibit, it starts out at 4.5 billion years ago with life emerging from the primordial ooze, right? So the question is, it's that they need to build the one in front of that, like, well, how did that come to be, right? There's the real question. And so they, again, natural, the mac macro evolution holds to all that life we know happened from a that non-living substances that life happened by chance. Microevolution is small developments within one species, and that's what Darwin observed on the Galapagos Islands. He observed the tortoise shells and the beaks of the birds in the species because it was a completely, it was a system cut off from the rest of the world. He noticed there were some variations in the different, uh, you had these shell sizes were different, and beak sizes were different. So he noticed that within separate species, there were variations Kind of like uh, everyone here, if we have a dog, our dogs all look different, right? They're dogs, but there is some variations in the species. Um, natural selection is the idea. This is what is assumed in evolutionary theory, that living organisms that are most fitted to their environment survive. They survive and they multiply while the rest will perish. And so this is the, that's the strongest survive, right? Survival of the fittest. And so those traits that continue are the ones that are passed on so the strong traits continue while the rest die off and that's the theory of natural selection or survival of the fittest and that the strongest survive and so natural selection is a key part of all of this uh, of macro evolution and that's the basic building block 
of the theory of evolution, that we evolved over time as a complete product of chance, passing off those traits to our offspring and over those years in time, that's the, those strong traits, everything else perished. And then Grudem gives 16 arguments against evolution. I'm gonna work just for a few of these. You can read these in the chapter. There were 16 reasons, questions he gave. And I'm gonna start with number 15 because I think it goes back to, we talked about my thoughts on this, is that really this is we have to remember is that people will believe anything but the Bible. If we do not hold that there is a God who created, we're not going to hold, someone's not going to hold to the scripture, and that changes everything, right? I'm not going to read this uh, quote. This was from a scientist. No, nope, this was from Grudem. Um, in fact, here, you know what? Let's do read this. It seems as though they or people will believe in anything as long as, long as it's not a belief in the personal God of scripture who calls us to forsake our pride, humble ourselves before him, ask his forgiveness for failure to obey his moral standards, and submit ourselves to his moral commands for the rest of our lives. To refuse to do this, though, it's irrational, but as we shall see in the chapter on sin, all sin or rebellion against God is ultimately irrational in its root. But I think this is, again, good for us to remember is that you get people who do not hold to what we believe see this as complete foolish. There's really no topic or forum for conversation on this, correct? And people will believe anything but the Bible. And so if you're not holding the Bible, what you're left with is evolution's got to be it, that's what we have, right? What else is there? So we're going to fall. That's our fallback. So thoughts or questions on that? All right, let's keep moving. Here's, I think there's, I did three more. Um, Non-living matter. This is, again, under the list of questions that Grudem had about evolution. Non-living matter does not contain and cannot produce the information necessary for life. And he quoted a scientist here, which I did not footnote. Um, I'll put that, I'll fix that. But those who think scientists understand how prebiotic chemical mechanisms produce the first life are misinformed, meaning that there really is not an explanation how we went from just matter, non-living matter, to create life. And again, I don't think that's the real question. The real question is how did the non-living matter get there to, be, to begin with, right? That's the real question that is not answered. But even with this is how do we go from dust and just uh, the, the elements in their pure form, how do we go from the elements interacting with each other to produce life? How did life come out? Living organisms come out of that uh, of the elements. And uh, so there really isn't a, a solid answer for that. In the millions of research dollars spent to try and solve that, right? It's, it's unbelievable how hard people are trying to make that thing. Decades and millions of dollars of people trying to make that a thing just because they don't want to believe in God. Yeah. And they have to find a way a to make life out of nothing because they just refuse the word of God. It's yeah. unbelievable. Because God can be, that's exactly that, it. That can't be true, right? So that this has to be. So we keep, that has to be true. If we just search hard enough, we'll find that answer. Correct. You're absolutely right, Micah. You're absolutely right. And they're going to keep searching, but right now, this to say how all that happened is a question mark, and it's also a major question mark how all that all those elements got to be there in the first place. Because matter is not eternal, and no scientist would tell you that matter is eternal. And so the question is, how did it all be? There? I said I mentioned earlier, we Lori and I were watching a show uh, Stephen Hawking did before he died. He was a if you read any of his books, he. Um, he gave an explanation of how something could come from nothing. And he did it through the physics of dark matter in the universe, and he likened it to this. Here's what his explanation. If you go out into your backyard and dig a hole, okay, you dig a big hole in your yard, you're gonna put the pile of dirt here, but what you have is a hole, and the universe works in the same way, is you can create matter, is the, the matter created is the dirt pile, but you still have the hole that's there because the sum is zero. All that dirt came from the hole. Therefore, that is how the universe could create something out of nothing. And that's what happens in the universe. And that's his theory. Again, because it has to be, we have to come up with, you, you, you can't make something out of nothing. So then the question is, how did it get there? That is, and science is really working hard, to your point, Micah, to figure that one out, but haven't yet. Um. 
the point of Mike's talking and you're talking about is scripture. Where does it say that they um, are ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth? That can be applied, I think, to this situation. They're trying to come up with an explanation for the way it is. And the truth is already there in the scriptures. Um, but to find another answer, you've got to study and study and study. And it cannot be found that way. I think we have to be careful with even our own. It's easy to kind of look back and roll our eyes at that, but we got to remember we would we would be there at the same place if it wasn't for God opening our own minds. Yeah. One other thing maybe worth mentioning is uh, the theory of evolution really took hold in a time when we didn't have the science we have now, and they saw what looked like life spontaneously coming from nothing. I mean, you know, you see maggots and stuff like that. I mean, they really looked at stuff and wondered, well, how did that get there? Well, it came from nothing. So, 150 years ago, maybe it made a little sense. But as we moved down the road, the questions were bigger, bigger, bigger. And the questions, questions are real. These are real, honest questions. And any scientist who is honest will say, All right, we can, there's, there's questions here we don't know. If this has to be it, because to view a God created this is utter foolishness. So there's this is the framework. We're just not sure how it all works. Any a scientist would have to land and say and agree with that. Chris, I like how there's uh, you know he quotes this uh, gentleman in here, Johnson, um, that a living organism emerged by chance from a prebiotic soup that is as, that is as likely as a tornado sweeping through a junkyard that might assemble a Boeing seven forty seven. From materials uh, therein, a chance of this uh, a chance chance assembly is just like naturalistic way of saying miracle. You know, and they would, and, you know they give uh, you know, these mathematic equations and uh, you know ten to the three hundred forty million, million power or something like that. It's just it, it it's just like mind blowing. And you know these are scientists looking at this stuff and they see the numbers and. Yeah, right. That's the best they got. Right. You know. And that's a good segue to the number seven. We've talked about this too. The irreducible complexity of a living cell defies a chance or evolutionary explanation. Remember, I put, we showed you the pictures of the biochemical pathways of the human cells. There's 37 trillion cells in our bodies. And so you look at those biochemical pathways and you look at that complexity and that's just a small picture of the at irreducible complexity. We talk about s the space and the macro world, and you look at this complexity and think this all happened. You took just by chance, and you look and say, wait a minute, this is the world is <laughs> the unimaginable complexity. Pete, go ahead. Well, they going off of what Mike has said. It isn't just that they don't want to believe, that they want to prove this because <clears throat> if they have to acknowledge that God exists, then they have to deal with the whole thing. They have to deal with Jesus, they have to deal with the resurrection, they have to deal with all of it. But if they can prove that there is no God because creation came about some other way, then they can dismiss all the rest of it as well. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's true. Well said. I, uh, let's look at another one. The fossil record is filled with gaps. So if you're so here's what this this quote or this statement is on here because and here's a definition of transitional types of fossils. If you have if you have species evolving over time, over millions and millions and millions of years, and that you got, you would see then in the fossil record just everywhere species and states of evolution that, that have not quite made it yet, right? And so, but the fossil record is missing in that you don't find that. And so you would think if this was the truth, you see, we see fossils, but where are the, really, they should be everywhere buried in the layers of rock, the evidence of all the species that were in the process of evolving, yet we don't see that. That's a major question that is not answered either. Uh, you would think that that would be there. The fo we have fossils. You know, go, to the, you know, go back to downtown Chicago and walk in, there's fossils everywhere. But you would think that you've got these fossils here, but what about the in-between processes between all the species? It should be everywhere in the fossil record, yet it is missing. And that's another major question as well. And then this was more practical. Um, we talked about this last week too. This is the last point that he made is the destructive influences. Now, 
This is not against evolution. This is just saying if you're going to believe it, this is some of the this is some of the beliefs that come out of it. And so here's the destructive influences of evolutionary theory. Uh, there is for the one I'm summarizing here. There is no higher purpose to our existence. This is it. We get this life. You get your years, and that's it. Whether that's 10 years, or 20 years, or 90 years, that's it. And then there is no more. And also, there is no morality in natural selection. And survival of the fittest is just that. It's promoting the species above all else is what matters. And anything that promotes the species is good because that is, it's a matter of survival. There is no right or wrong. There is no morality. It's the, it's the pride of lions attacking the baby gazelle. It looks so cute. They'll rip it up, they'll tear it to pieces and eat it alive because why? They need to survive. There's no morality in that. There's no right or wrong. They're just doing what they need to do to survive. It doesn't matter that the baby gazelle is now is, is helpless and they could, it, that has nothing to do with it. So there is no morality in natural selection. There's just promotion of the species. Now, you've got to remember those two things apply to us as human beings as well. We are just a more highly evolved species on this planet. And so you've got to think now about the implications of that, of that mindset lived out in truth. That is a mindset that is very, very hard to live out as a human being because there is no purpose for life other than to be as comfortable as you can be in the short time you have and survive. That's it. There's no answer. That's it. And you can see why if you really think that through, one, it leads to despair. And two, it's got some pretty scary implications for, you think of government regimes and you think of there is no right or wrong in an evolutionary system. It's, you, it's your right and wrong is what you decide to carve out for you, but you can't put that on anybody else, nor can they ascribe anything to you. It's just you're just doing your best to make it through, be at peace and survive. That's it. If you have to, you do whatever you can to survive. Uh, I pulled this off of um, a website. I've gone back to this sometime. That it's an atheist website that says, it talks about that we do not need a religious God, or atheists don't, to find morality and goodness in life. And here's some of the reasons that are given. They calls it enlightened self-interest. I've talked about this in the past. And that here's some statements that are made in beliefs. So this is coming from, again, a worldview that holds to natural selection, evolutionary theory, how we can create meaning outside of a system of a God says this, humans will naturally practice good moral and ethical behavior because it is in their best interest to do so. Meaning this, if I'm going around in my neighbor's garages and stealing stuff out of them every night, eventually my neighbors will rise up and in old days probably shoot me. Uh, but at least nothing else, I'll be prosecuted, could lose my home. So therefore, it's not in my best interest to do that. So therefore, that, not in my best interest, keeps me from doing that. Therefore, that's how society functions. And um, again, I think it's interesting that it's not me, me stealing tools is not wrong. There is no wrong or right in the system. Remember this. It's not wrong. It just means that it's not good for me because I might be prosecuted. They would get revenge. Bad things might happen. Therefore, I don't do that because it's not in my best interest to do so. And that society, when left to its own, will come to that. I would just pick up a newspaper. I don't know if that's necessarily true. That we, I don't think society acts um, in good ways because it's in their best interest to do so. And then also we see these behaviors modeled in the animal kingdom. You see communal, they take care of each other. Therefore, uh, we as higher evolved animals, and that's passed down genetically, we will do the same. And yet, again, let's go to the pride of lions. They're also killing to survive because they, that's what lions do. And again, if that's where we are, I just the implications of this are, are scary. And also last was it's in our nature, again, from a, this is from a secular worldview. It is in our nature, fortunately, to seek happiness for our fellows, other people at the same time as we seek it for ourselves. And I don't know if that's necessarily true either. I don't know if I would hold to that. I don't think it is in our nature to seek others' happiness as we seek it for ourselves. Josh. I think that if you take this to the extreme, um, this is where we see um, uh, the, uh, the Nazi party and the final solution. This is where you see uh, Stalin and, uh, um, and him exterminating millions of Jews. Um, that, uh, that that was, this is their argument, that, that, that this is natural selection, 
right? That only the strong will survive. And they looked at um, they look at uh, these other cultures and find that they are weaker, and so they get rid of them. And so they don't they don't find <clears throat> excuse me any issue with that because like the pride of lions, right, attacking the, the gazelle. That's what's happening here. That's their, that's that's the ultimate uh, reasoning for for why they're doing that, why they were doing that, and so. Um, you know, this secular website is clearly wrong in that because this is this, that is ultimately what's going to happen, right? Is that uh, for you older gentlemen in here, uh, you're not useful to us anymore, and so we're just going to get rid of you. That's that's what they would say, and uh, that's not that's not good enough. And I like all you guys so much. He was kidding, by the way. Yeah, thanks, Josh. And and remember this too, guys. If if this is all there is, then what I, what we just read is an attempt to create meaning and purpose out of a really senseless existence. And uh, the answer we we've heard of stories of personal tragedy that our brothers here have shared. And in this worldview, there's no there isn't anything to say about that. It just is. It just happened. There's no, no reason, reason for tragedy. tragedy. There's no reason for any of this. And so you can see throughout history is that so uh, people have tried to create some sense of purpose out of life if we're not going to hold to absolute truth and so this is what the attempt is and we you know what this this really should help push us to have compassion on a lost world around us that is in despair and this is where the gospel comes in it's that it's we weren't created for that and that there is truth and so our hearts should be moved by that when we read this because it's just people trying to make sense of an absolutely meaningful existence. And that's really what it is. And so I just I think that's uh, good for us to keep in mind. Let's keep moving here. Uh, this is BBC. This is our church's doctrine of origin. I took this, to, and this is what our church teaches. God chose to create the universe and all that is in it to reveal his glory, divine nature, and eternal power, infinite wisdom, and supreme authority. Uh, in review... Uh, these are the positions that can be held by members of VBC. So you can hold to a solar day. Uh, you can hold to young earth, hold it old earth, the gap theory, or you can hold to, we allow people to hold to theistic evolution. And now, Grudem would really agree with, disagree with that last one and spends a lot of time saying no uh, and gives a whole lot of good reasons why theistic evolution should not be included in this list. But I think it's important to say that we have a teaching position, which is uh, which is a young earth, we do that as our teaching position of the church, is that we just decided that not to make a big argument issue for someone who does hold to this that would still say that in the beginning God created, he just used theistic evolution to do so. Um, I don't think there's anyone on the leadership team that holds to this, but we decided not to make an issue and allow for people to hold that position and still be a member of the church. There was a great debate over that, but including this last bullet point, uh, when that position paper was written, but we did decide not to make an issue of it, even though there's no one on the leadership team or any of our pastors that would hold to that. And so I did. So I wanted to put that up there, and you can go to our website if you are an attender or a member of this church. If you want to read more on that, uh, it's a it's a it's a well written it's a well, it's a well written uh, paper and worthy of reading if if you're an attender of the church. Uh, no. No, I did not. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a this is continuing from our own. This this paper is a word to teachers because again we've held we have a teaching position for unity's sake, much like on end times as well and other and other positions. And again, this is for this is the Village Bible Churches, our church is uh, distinctive on this. Uh, we believe that the Word of God is an objective, propositional revelation, verbally inspired in every word, inerrant in the original documents, infallible, it's God-breathed. And here's what we teach on Doctrine of Origin. We teach uh, the literal, grammatical, historical interpretation, meaning that Genesis 1-3 through 3 is literal, uh, of Scripture, which affirms the belief that the opening chapters of Genesis present crea present creation in six literal days. So we teach as a 24-hour, six literal day. That's a teaching position of this church. Now, we don't ask people to hold to that. We just say for unity's sake, that's the teaching position of the church. We understand that there are some people that will hold to old earth, uh, hold to a gap theory, uh, and I 
we're even allowing some members to hold to theistic evolution. Uh, but uh, this is the teaching unifying position of the church. So, uh, for example, in this context, I'm teaching, I'm teaching, we're going to go through the different theories, but if we were going to teach it, uh, it that we'd say that this is where we would land as a church, but here's the, some of the other theories, another, what I would say, brothers and sisters in Christ hold to under that umbrella in the beginning God created. Questions about that? Comments? How strict are you with um, Sunday school teachers teaching older kids? Uh, are they allowed to come into the teaching position with uh, that last book and still teach the kids? You know, assuming that they'll say, well, the church teaches this, but, but I believe this. Yeah, and that's, and that's what we have to be careful of, especially with children. So on a scale, if, you're t if, you, if, if the same person's in a small group with adults, it's going to be a different context than it is with kids. We're going to ask that teachers hold to this just for unity's sake. But, yet, I think, but I think it's okay. There's a context for saying, but here's some other theories that could fall under the Genesis creation account as well. But I think with kids, we have to be a little bit more careful, probably to hold a little more closely to this uh, but there is context for saying that. And we have to, churches have, have to have unifying positions on these things. Otherwise, there's going to be some chaos. Same with end times. Churches are going to have to land and say, this is where we hold to. But allowing some charity for saying that there are other followers of Christ that may not hold exactly to this, but still under the umbrella, under the umbrella of in the beginning God created. And then this is important as well. Um, I'm just going to go to the this highlight of, sentence. Any teaching that elevates this position to a primary issue is out of step with the guiding elders. And so I think it's important for us to realize that, that this was not meant to be a divisive issue because, as our brother Chris just said, God did not say specifically how. He says he created, and but there is some question in there of exactly how it all happened. Therefore, it should not be elevated to a primary issue of argument that divides the church. And this position, this this has divided the church, especially in the last 50 years. It really has been an issue. In times, we talked about that last week, has there been a divisive issue in the church, and we don't believe that it should. So we're allowing for, under the umbrella of God created, that there are going to be some different beliefs, but we do have a unifying teaching position. Any questions or comments about that? Actually, in the chapter, I page 289, the older version, it says it's, it's just less important in matters of other things like yeah. humanity and creating the image of God and things like that. So if we're making it, you know, if we're elevating it as, as it's said there, then we're, we're kind of out of, uh, out of step in what we ought to be focusing our time and our <laughs> opinions and discussions with others. Right. And if we're using it as a litmus test, if you're of true faith, that's a great error as well. Yet, maybe not saying that practically, sometimes we do that. We just we have to be careful with that, we do. All right, theistic evolution, that God used the process of evolution to bring about all life forms on earth. Uh, this takes a very non-literal view of the creation story, very non-literal, meaning that God used evolution as his, he created through and used, directed and guided the whole process of evolution. That's theistic evolution in, uh, in, in, in summary. Um, you know what, I'm going to go back to, because, just a minute, I don't think, yep, I'm going to go back to this just for a minute. There's about 20 lists that grew to, a list of about 20 sentence statements that he makes, why he disagrees with theistic evolution and should not be in the framework of a, of a believer's belief system about creation. So I'll let you read those for yourself and do your own personal study on that so without going through them. Uh, but just uh, this one gets this one is uh, does create some uh, pa passionate discussion on should it be allowed the church we decided to not make it an issue and to just allow it as long as someone says in the beginning God created do I believe does any of the church leaders hold to this at this point no uh, but did not want to make that uh, a divisive issue therefore it's allowed for members to be able to hold to that uh, but I'll let you read some of the you can read he spends probably 15 20 pages. Uh, on this topic. Uh, gap theory. This, uh, the gap theory is interesting. This would go to back to an older theory. It says that Genesis 1-1 and then in between there, Genesis 1-2, 
is that uh, there is, could have been millions and billions of years happening, we just don't know. So this would mean uh, that uh, there was God created, okay? And then anybody, you know what, tell you what, somebody read, open your Bible to Genesis 1, 1, and 2. Somebody read 1, 1, and we'll pause for a second, then read 1, 2. So somebody read Genesis 1, 1, and 2, please. God, I think you got it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, okay. Stop. stop. Okay, he did that. And then there was all of this time that could have taken place. The universe expanded these things. You could insert anything you want there. And then Genesis 1-2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So, so God, God created all these things are happening. There's a massive gap in between. Now, I put this here in these little brackets because uh, in the original... Grudem's changed a lot. These chap this chapter has changed a lot in the 20-something years since the first edition came out. So he did add on there, though it's highly unlikely. That's Grudem's. I just put that in the bracket. So he does say that's the gap theory, but he views it, he views it as highly unlikely that, that's, uh, um, that that happened. And then we get to the rest of um, the creation account after that. Uh, there was a second creation, or creation continued after that. But it allows for some time for some of these things to happen why it appears we have uh, an old earth now, okay? So that's the gap theory. I'll let you do some more study on that. Here's some other questions that came up. How old is the human race? It's not taught specifically in scriptures. Uh, modern science estimates 35 to 40,000 years ago that human beings first came on the world scene. Uh, now, we look at the gaps, I'm sorry, we look at the genealogy lists in the, in the scriptures. And remember we talked about James Usher about 400 years ago. He counted all the years. He took all the genealogies, all the years, and went back. And he came up with the conclusion that the earth was created in 4004 B.C., about 6,000 years ago. And that's still held by many today. Uh, if you go back and count the gene genealogy, you count this, the earth is about 6,000 years old. And th that, would be a young, now for, that would be a young earth theory. It's probably the most common and popular. Uh, but... Uh, as Grudem goes on to talk about, there is gaps. Most people would hold to that there is some gaps in the genealogies. Because if you read the lists, you, know, you could say that uh, Matthew says Joseph was a son of David. But this means that he is in the lineage of, and that it was common to use language like that uh, in, uh, in cultures to, you wouldn't go from exactly what we would, son to son to son. We, to, we're, we don't do that in our culture, but you could do that son of, meaning could go back multiple generations. There probably were gaps and that Grudem's point was prior to Abraham, which is about 1800 to 2000 years before Christ, so approximately 4000 years ago, uh, the dates get really hard just because we don't have some of the writings and all that. It's just diffi it's difficult to really ascertain exact dates prior to Abraham. So prior to 4000 years ago, uh, it's difficult to do that. So there are gaps in the genealogies. So how old is the human race? The scriptures doesn't say. That may be a question mark anywhere from but who knows? It just depends on what you're going to hold to with creation. Uh, did animals die before the fall? That's a great question. Because that will depend on whether you hold to a young earth or an old earth. So if you're a young earth, if you, if you hold to a young earth theory that the earth is young, that is 6,000 years old or maybe 25,000 years old, um, that uh, no, because death began with sin, right? So the animals couldn't have died until sin entered into the world. Um, the old earth would say animals did die. Um, for example, was there millions of years in the garden? We don't know. Was there a gap when these things happened? Um, you've got, we know that God judged the spiritual realm with the fall of Lucifer so that there was rebellion in creation already. So the question is, and then did God then create the earth with dead animals already in the layers of rock? if it's a young earth. So there's some, there's some questions, correct? And we have to think of that, well, it's, I don't know. And uh, so that's, that's, did animals die before the fall? It just depends on what you're gonna hold to, whether a young earth or an old earth. And I know in taking some very heavy topics and moving quickly, uh, you're gonna have to do some research on your own because uh, there's a lot here. All right, dinosaurs. It's a big question mark, yes? What about the dinosaurs? Uh, if you hold to a young earth, that dinosaurs lived alongside humans, they died in the flood, and then the flood synthesized millions of years of compression and put bones and fossils in the rocks uh, into the rock layers. So if you're going to hold to the young earth, that yes. And then there's scriptures that talk about Leviathan. Uh, some say, I get to go back and look, Job talks about, alludes to like perhaps a brontosaurus. 
Um, but I would probably say it's inconclusive, but a young earth person would say, well, the humans and dinosaurs had to cohabitate, had to live together. Uh, old earth, that there was death, would believe that there's death in the animal world uh, before the fall, and that day one could have lasted, again, millions and millions of years, that the days perhaps are not literal. There could have been a gap theory that these dinosaurs were created, lived and died before that humans came onto the scene. That's a possibility. And so, that, again, depends on whether you hold to an old earth or hold to a young earth with dinosaurs. I know in the, uh, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, I know I'm kind of reading in, uh, really early in Job. Um, uh, Job talks about the bite, and so not, at, at, at no point in the Bible have I ever seen the term uh, dinosaur used. And, um, but uh, there's uh, a Leviathan, that term is used. And, um, and it's, it's used in a way that uh, it's a giant creature that is uh, um, very powerful. Um, but uh, that, that's the way I uh, read it. Um, but, um, uh, you know, so th there, there's almost proof in there that, you no, know, the term dinosaur wasn't there, but Leviathan or the, or the serpents in the water, I can't remember those names that they used, where uh, they, they were side by side. And it sounded like that they were they were fighting them. I'm trying to remember exact scripture, but I, I know it's in the Old Testament. You know, Job to or earlier. Uh, and, and, yeah, right. And that's the question: Is that uh, did did humans live with dinosaurs, or did God create already in the appearance of a a mature creation, meaning that? He created the Grand Canyon already a mile deep. He created trees that were old. Adam and Eve were adults. And then he also created then, did he create dinosaurs already bedded and embedded in layers of rock? Was that created that way or did that happen? And so there's the question again. Are we going to hold to a young earth or hold to an older theory of creation? Um, so the question then coming back to the days, are the days of creation 24 hours, literally? Or are they uh, non-literally that there were longer periods of time? Or the other theory is they were 24 hours, but then in between each day, there were long, long, long periods of time. So I guess there's a third one there, but really are the days to be taken exactly literal of a 24 hour sunset to, to sunset, 24 hour period, uh, or it was that meant to be literal that there could have been longer periods of time. Uh, Grudem spends a lot of time in the chapter as well, talking about multiple types of evidence that indicate the earth and the universe are billions of years old. So he spends a lot of time with that, and I don't recall him doing that in the first book. So it's almost in some way seems he may have changed his position in this, uh, but he goes through 12, uh, what he gives evidence that is possible that, we, that the universe is billions of years old, as modern science said, but again, under the umbrella that God created it. And so he gives, uh, he talks about the expansion rate of the universe, um, talks about uh, the starlight that we see coming to us because if a star is a billion light years away, when you see its light, you're seeing light that had to travel a billion years to get to us. So did God create that starlight already here or has we wait, have we waited a billion years for that starlight to get to us? That's the question. And so he gives a whole uh, ice layers. The he said, you, you go back, you can see that the ice layers are compact. You can see that it's, there's age there. Did God create again that appearance of age? Or there, and that's how he started? Or did that actually happen over time? Sediment layers, rock layers, all of those things. And so he gives some evidence that indicates that from science. And as a Christian, it's okay to, what he's saying is okay to hold to that under the umbrella of God created. So here's some older theories, the day-age view, that each day is an age or millions of years. It wasn't meant to be a 24-hour literal period. It's just, each met is meant as an age. It's a section or a session of the creation that happened, and it could have been millions, if not more years, each one. Um, and, or there are long periods of time between the 24-hour days of creation that each day is a literal 24-hour period with long gaps or long years in between each literal 24-hour day. Um, so that's uh, some older theories. Uh, let's continue with, there's two more, analogical and this, that the you know, analogical days view and the literary framework. These are more um, non, these are very non-literal views of the creation account. Uh, so, the, so the view that uh, the creation is just an analogy, 
is the word day is not literal. It's an analogy for how God created in an orderly fashion. It was never meant to be studied literally. And some, there are Christians who would hold to that the book of Revelation or in times was never meant to be studied literally. Um, it's metaphorical. It's poetic. It talks about we're not supposed to draw literal conclusions from Revelation. We're supposed to draw that Christ is coming in power and glory, not to try to come up with days and the names of countries and all of this. Uh, as a, that it was never meant to be taken literally. And the literary framework is the same, um, that God just, we have the, that God gave us the account of creation to talk about his creativity and really to highlight that we are the apex or the, um, the we are at the top of creation, is us, and that he created, uh, that created humanity. That's what it's for. It's not meant to be taken literally. So those are some older theories, uh, younger theories um, that we have, Creation with an appearance of age, talked about that, that God created everything with the layers and all of that, and the starlight that travels a billion light years through the universe to get to us is already here. We had we didn't have to, he didn't create the star, we've waited a billion years for it to get here. We already created it mature and created it with age. And then the next one is flood geology, and that's uh, popular. I know that the uh, the Creation Institute, uh, is, is the Creation Museum is big on that, the, the flood created the appearance of millions of years of evolution because the massive forces and pressures of all that water compacting everything the death just smashing everything down created in one short year what looks like to be old earth and millions of years of of evolution occurring and so that's a possibility as well those are two of the young earth theories so conclusions and i think this is important so let's wrap this up is that both views are acceptable, whether you hold to a young earth or hold to an old earth. And I think it's good if one of us, if some hold tightly to one, that's okay. Hold to your belief. Um, but just remember that I think that's a good place to land in the church. Is under the umbrella of in the beginning God created that both views are acceptable. Because both would hold to the same. Yes, God created just how he did it. We have our views that are, that are a little bit different. And so I think that's a good place to stop and a good place to land. Thoughts or comments before we continue? Because i got a question. We're going to do an activity to wrap this up. Yeah. If you believe the uh, from sunset to sunset is a million mm -hmm. years, how can that sustain life when you have 500,000 years of dark, darkness? Black light or anything else will not survive. Right. There, there are, are questions right. and good questions. And Grudem brings those up for every single one of these theories. He brings up good questions about each one. And uh, there's a, even, a, even a younger theory, if you hold to that, is you know, the dinosaurs and the geology and some of that is a question is, did God create dinosaurs just already buried in the... And so there's good questions for everyone that just questions that... Because I, I don't think we were meant to know exactly how it happened. Um, I don't think that was God's purpose in doing it. It was his... So, I mean, did God need... Six days, if we hold to that literal, did he need, a, it talks about days. Did he need six days to create and seven days and one day to rest? Was, was he really tired after six days of doing all that work? No. The six days were written for his sovereign purposes for us. Did he, could he have done all that in just a mere instantaneous thought? Yes. He didn't need six days. He wasn't tired after this. Did he, we talked about this last week. Did God have to create because he was lacking in glory? No, he did it for his own sovereign purposes. He did it in this way as given to us in the scriptures for his reason and purpose. He knows that, and even if we don't know all of it. So we were not meant to know all the details um, outside the fact that God did create. And I think that's good for us to recognize as well. So there's, good, there's great questions for every single one of those theories. There really are. And uh, I don't uh, personally, uh, I will land and hold to the church's position, but I'm certainly open to an old age as well. Um, I don't totally know. I'm still researching and studying that on my own too. I don't know where each of you land. Um, you, I, it's okay to hold strongly to one of the positions. I think that's good, but I think it's just to remember that I think there's place in the church for both views to be acceptable. Okay, we're going to do this. I'm going to fast forward because I think it's time. I'm going to go a little bit over, guys, so I apologize for that today. Whoops. But it's the last one, so, okay. Uh, just a minute. That's not the one I want. There it is. Okay. 
So here's what I'd like to do. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to switch gears here. We've been doing this for 16 weeks. You guys have been coming early on Saturday mornings for four months. I believe back in January we started this. And uh, here's what I'd like you to think about for just a minute is this, is that over the past 16 weeks of this class, what's something you have learned, something you've been reminded of, or perhaps come to view in a new way? Because I, the whole purpose of this is we've just wrapped up creation. We're going to start chapter 16, the providence of God, and we come back in September. But our whole purpose for doing this was to know more of who our God is. And so when you think about that, in four months, 16 weeks of coming, I want everyone to think, because I want to share out around the tables with this, and I want you to be able to share. Um, you can take a pass if you feel uncomfortable talking, but what's something that you have learned, maybe that God's reminded you of, or you've learned or been reminded more in a deeper way of who our God is, um, think about that for a second. I'll give you some think time. Then I want to do one last table discussion. And let's just talk about that for a second. It can be anything. We think back of the 16 weeks. What's something that comes to comes to mind? So I'll give you a second to think about it. And let's discuss. This will be our final table discussion. I know Josh wants to close us in prayer. But let's uh, let's take a few minutes. So uh, give, me, um, give me a few more. I know we're going a little bit over. But let's think about that. Give you some think time. Then I want you to share out in your tables. <laughs> Francis already like this. Francis, how are you? I can hear you now. Yes, I can. Glad you've been able to join us. We're going to start again on September 11th. We'll take a break for summer here so we can see what we're going to do. We're going to take a few yeah. months off and we're going to start again. So I hope. Many years. Now, where are you going to be in September? Are you still going to be in Thailand? Well, I don't feel about it. I can go down all the time. Okay, so I hope you can still join us. We're going to start to put out the same thing. And I'll get to join us. I'm going to 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 get to join us. I'm
But science now is also much more that is showing that there are some of the yeah, Okay, would that intention never yeah. ever be yeah. to it yeah. 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 If I would have all the there's nothing to that for me something you can't do. All right, guys, let's wrap up our discussions. I hope everyone got a chance to share out. So let's just share some of these. Anybody willing to share just something to learn? Yes. I've been, you know, I've grown up in the church. I've gone to Bible college. I went up to Seattle University. Um, and throughout all of the study you do, the we had um, basically sermons every every day of every week, Monday through Friday. And even through all those and all the you know the year I was there, you don't realize how big your God is. Um, in a video that we my dad sent us, uh, Louis Giglio talks about the biggest star we can see. And you can fit, what is it, like 43 trillion golf balls inside the size if of your golf ball? If you're if you're you're a golf ball, you can fit 43 trillion golf balls inside of this. You're pretty big. And you realize that God holds our universe in his hand. Um, I, did the, I did the math for the size of our earth, the size of our universe by visible light we can see, and it's 9.63 times 10 to the 33rd billion light years. That's how much we can actually see in volume of our universe. And he holds that. And we can't even see what's left. And it just, it, it's its shocking how small we are in comparison to how great and majestic and mysterious he is. He's huge. And we, we, we think our problems are so big. <laughs> and it, it's just, it's, it's, you can't even fathom how, you know, how great that feeling is. Okay. Good. Well said. <laughs> how big and awesome he is and how small and insignificant we are as humans but he elevates us up to live with him for those who believe in him and and he forgives our sins when we come to him and ask for forgiveness. And uh, once again, he just elevates us up, you know. Uh, what, what, what's your, your... It's just a very strange book, you know, because it wraps us down to nothing. And then it, and then it makes us the most special person on the planet. It's a weird book that way. The only way you really know your own saying. human nature is to read scripture and realize you are you have problems. You have serious problems. And yet you're the, you're the most special, you know. So yeah. It's a weird book. Yeah. It's an amazing truth from both of you. Yeah. Anyone else? else? I always like to be reminded of the inerrancy of scripture, right? It's something I've taught since I've been taught since I was little that the Bible is truth. But I think that's a good thing for us to continue to study frequently, especially in the world that we live in, that 
continues to try to come up with new truth, which that statement alone is an oxymoron, right? But so I think that was probably my, been my favorite of the first 16 is just to can be reminded of the scripture. Because I just think we need to remember where our source of truth is because it's easy to make up our own. And it's under attack right now, too, on every side, even within the church, even within the church, fewer and fewer churches are holding to the inerrancy of Scripture. Anyone else? For me personally, it, uh, it, going off of what you guys shared, it's amazing to think of this God that he actually cares for me. And that great? It, that's amazing. It uh, that's, uh, shouldn't be, right? And yet, uh, we'll get to a chapter on adoption. It just always just absolutely amazes me that not only, not only does he love us and save us, he also then relates to us as a father relates to their children. And he didn't have to do that. And I think that's just absolutely amazing. So we'll get there. Just it's, All this is a good reminder to me how great our God is, how small we are. What an amazing thing that we can worship Him. And uh, that's, I hope as you walk away from the first 16 weeks that you're encouraged not just to regroup them, but to go back to the Scriptures. And uh, I hope uh, that the teaching has been a blessing for you. It has been for me in study. I look forward to picking this up again in September. Uh, my goal is to get uh, a couple months ahead through the summer, but I probably won't. And <laughs> But that's my goal. And I look forward to being able to start this up with my favorite chapters coming. We'll start with uh, chapter 16 uh, the providence of God, God's sovereignty, and we'll get into the whole discussion on how do you, what the human free will, do we have free will, and how do you even define that? So it's, I think it's understanding our next chapter, 16, is the whole framework for understanding, uh, really, we get because we're going to talk about, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yep, leaving it right there. <laughs> I'm stopping. Uh, so with that, guys, thank you. Uh, Pete, we're going to sing one last time, just a minute, let me back this up. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his and the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me never forget. That though the wrong seems all so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King, let Uh, it was interesting yesterday. Uh, I was having a conversation uh, with somebody that Steve knows um, at work, and uh, um, it was really interesting because we ran the gamut of uh, of politics and creation and scripture and all of that. And he is he would consider himself a spiritual person, uh, someone that believes in spiritual things, um, a creator, but would not say that that the Bible is true. And so um, he started arguing with me about different things. And I finally just said to him, we're, we're coming from two completely different places. And he's like, how so? And I said, well, I believe that the Bible is inerrant in, in the way that it's written. So everything there is true. And he's like, yeah, I don't believe that at all. I was like, then we can't, then we, this conversation's over. 
right? Like we can't, we're coming from two totally different places, right? And at some point we have to be okay with that, right? It's not gonna do any good for my relationship with this individual to continue to argue with him um, and make my point from scripture and, uh, and recognize that there's things that we don't know um, if, if the other side isn't going to do the same, right? And I think that's a big takeaway from, uh, for me from this, this last chapter is there's a lot of things that we don't know. There's a lot of things that we're not told in scripture. Um, but if we start, like John said, with God created, um, that, that there's a lot of room for, for, uh, generosity within that. And so, um, with that, uh, I just want to take a moment and, uh, uh, Steve, can you come up? Pete, can you come up? And John, can you come up real quick? Yeah, up here, in front where you were. <laughs> So on on uh, on Saturday mornings, um, none of this happens without these three guys. Like all I do is open the door and make sure there's tables out. That's it. Like I could train a monkey to, to do that. Um, but the teaching, John spends hours uh, preparing all this. So I mean, think of all the. I mean, I think there's a lot to read in those in, the, in that in those chapters, and yet he's he's spending uh, a bunch more time. Pete is, I don't know, I don't know if he has all this equipment just laying around or if he's buying yes. it. Either way, yes. it looks yes. awesome, and uh, um, and the time that it takes to do that. Um, and uh, Steve, Steve, we had a uh, uh, him and I were having a, an email discussion earlier in the. Uh, uh, or a text discussion earlier in the, in, in the year about him not being able to be there or we, we weren't having class or something like that. And, uh, and he labeled his coffee making no class coffee. And so um, uh, the coffee, all of that happens with, from these three guys. So I, wa I want to show my appreciation to these guys. Yeah, and Ethan, uh, I want to show my appreciation to these guys. Please give these guys a round of applause. <laughs> without them and uh, and it's hugely appreciated so uh, there's no way that I can pull off half of this so thank you guys but um, for the sake of time we are way over at this point let me pray for us uh, for the summer uh, and, uh, um, and going forward and uh, and then we'll get out of here father God Lord you are an awesome guy um, one that we cannot um, begin to fathom how great and awesome you are. Uh, Lord, yet you, um, you hold us in such high esteem um, to put us at the top of your creation. Just a little lower um, than the angels. Lord, I pray uh, for each of us that that would be um, uh, something we think about on a regular basis. Lord, uh, without, um, without you, uh, our relationship uh, with you is impossible. Lord, uh, allow us to uh, not be afraid of the hard conversations that are in our world, uh, to have confidence in knowing who you are and what you've done. Uh, Lord, we don't have all the facts, and that's okay, um, but we can have confidence that, uh, that you are creator, uh, you are the sustainer of all life. And uh, even though um, we may seem wrong in the moment, the facts uh, and the truth will always come out. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless us as, as we leave, leave this place and uh, go about our day. I thank you uh, and bless these guys as well. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.